let's collide. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, in, this is the first Brodo, and we've been very fortunate to have the, some of the brightest minds uh, in the art intersection of art and science and sustainability. And when I met Dilia, you know, she was traipsing through the palm-oiled uh, plantations of Thailand, looking for a Wi-Fi signal for us to Skype. Uh, Dilia is a PhD in, from Columbia University, specializing in the philosophy of science and aesthetics. Uh, she is presently the research curator for the Center of Environmental Humanities in Denmark. And on topic with us is her ongoing work, and I'm quotating this, quote, quoting this, um, uh, articulating the phil philosophical implications of artworks that take the form of scientific experiments. I said it was going to be a brainy weekend, right? Um, her current project is called A Year Without a Winter, which uh, revisits the environmental conditions under which Shelley's novel Frankenstein was written in the aftermath of the 1815 eruption of Mount Tambura in order to refame our contemporary climate crisis. <laughs> Got that. Uh, this is a new work that brings uh, philosophy and science fiction and scenario planning and bio and geochemistry and environmental history and visual art um, to, the, to the table. You get why she's here now. Um, the book is due out in a month, or this month. Uh, it is my great pleasure to invite to the stage our keynote speaker, Dulia Hanna. children, uh, scientists, and pretty much anyone, you can ask them, what would it be like if we were to face a year without a winter? Um, we're now in a situation where, of course, we, we in this room are well aware that climate change is destabilizing the seasons and bringing, wreaking all sorts of havoc on the world. Um, and one way of thinking about that is about, by thinking about one year a year that might be a stand-in for many years, nonetheless just one year in which the seasons would be unrecognizable. Um, so you have some napkins and, or some little papers um, tossed around on the chairs. Just take like one minute um, and maybe could you just scratch down or think to yourself or tweet if you do that, um, how, what you would say maybe to your grandchildren to explain to someone you, you loved in a simple way, um, what would happen uh, in a year without a winter in a place that maybe you're from or that you care about? Maybe before we collect them, I'll just ask, um, it's not a poetry competition, but would anyone, would anyone like to share anything that, that leaps to mind, um, something that would happen or that would change or that you would miss? Yeah. How you said it's invasions. Invasions, as everything invaded into a place that wasn't familiar anymore. So climate change would cause insects and plants and all that stuff to invade the space mm -hmm. where it was now Often one of the first things that people think to miss. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, a, w a year without a winter. I'm really excited about the roast tomorrow night um, because a year without a winter uh, would be great for the mosquitoes. Uh, it already is in many places, um, so it's not all that. Yeah, that's the scary prospect. Yeah. Uh, the red knots would get to um, Chatham 
uh, before the uh, horseshoe crabs lay their eggs and they'd never be able to finish their migration. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, so the dysregulation not only of our cycles, but of all of the critters that we both uh, get along well with and um, also try to avoid encounters with, um, we would definitely have a lot of difficulty uh, having kind of, even, even for those of us that live in cities and are quite alienated from nature, so to speak, I think we would notice, as you suggest, like all sorts of um, ways that we would encounter animals and um, plants that are out of regulation and, and destabilized. So um, I actually think it's it's quite interesting and fun because I, we all, um, especially coming from different places and having different kinds of like cult of cultural relationships to the seasons, it's fascinating what people notice. And maybe we can come back to this over the course of the weekend. Um, I just maybe I'll just share with you a couple of, of co interesting comments that I were collected during a session um, at the COP23 this year, a, a session that I ran um, with collaborators from the Red Cross Red Crescent Society, and uh, maybe there was there was just one or two things that you know really didn't occur to me, but people were quite interested in um, the kind of cultural dependence on the seasons. And one person wrote, the thing you'll miss the most is the end of, at the end of winter uh, when the world comes alive again with spring. So it was also this kind of retreat, people spoke a lot about snow and socks and uh, this retreat into winter and the coziness, but it's also the way that it changes our relationship to the other seasons. Um, or someone from Sweden wrote about how the snow reflects the light in the winter, which is quite extraordinary, and that when the snow starts to not stay on the ground as long, the winter becomes incredibly much darker, which would never have occurred to me um, coming from New York, where we never had that much snow anyway, and the latitude is low. Um, or someone from Bangladesh wrote that uh, Winter is a chance to wrap yourself in the previous year's memories as you get out old socks and sweaters. So just by way of um, suggestion, I think it's, I, I like to offer up this question as a way of um, just cutting through the distinction of whether it's artists or scientists or um, experts or children, because actually it's a, this is a, a simple question that we all have associations and opinions about. But I'd love to tell you where it comes from, which is from the story of how Mary Shelley came to write uh, the story of Frankenstein. So you may know this story, and you've alluded to it a little bit. Um, but it began at a little episode during the summer of 1816, when um, Mary, uh, she was actually Mary Godwin, she had run off uh, with her lover, Percy Shelley, who uh, abandoned his wife in England and they sort of decided to elope, and it was all the scandal you can imagine of a bunch of British literati. And um, they found themselves in Geneva and, and asked a few years later how it was that an 18-year-old girl could come up with such a horrific story as Frankenstein. Uh, Mary wrote in the introduction to one of the later reprints of her book, in the summer of 1816, we visited Switzerland and became the neighbors of Lord Byron. At first, we spent our pleasant hours on the lake, but it proved a wet, ungenial summer, and incessant rain often confined us for days to the house. Some volumes of ghost stories, translated from German into French, fell into our hands. We'll each write a ghost story, said Lord Byron, and his proposition was acceded to. So this lovely little vignette of a summer holiday go gone wrong comes to be remembered as the dare. Um, the dare that they should each try to write a, a story as scary as a German ghost story, which of course is not possible. Um, but they were, they were quite good, so out of this uh, dare comes a, an early draft of Frankenstein. Also a vampire story, which is by all uh, expert accounts not very good, by John Polidori, who was uh, Lord Byron's doctor. Um, in which he he sort of presents Byron as as a vampire. So this is, it was a kind of literary innovation of not, not the best story, but these two kind of monsters emerge from this summer in which this uh, group of poets and uh, writers and scientists find themselves confined to a house for one at one point over the course of two days, um, and which time they spend, of course squabbling and drinking and having love affairs and trying to write the next 
great piece of literature. Um, but little do they knew, know during this period that this will prove to be not merely a wet, ungenial summer, but a cold and miserable and, in fact, catastrophic uh, climate crisis that lasted for three years and was part of a longer period that's often called the Little Ice Age. Um, and you can see uh, some suggestions of this environmental experience are, are kind of present in the novel. There's a lot of talk about um, storms and rains and fogs and um, encounters of the ice. Of course, partially it is because um, Mary Shelley is on holiday and she's off to see the sublime sights of the Alps. Um, but her experience is in a way uncomfortable enough that that sometimes registers in the way that her characters narrate their own encounters with natural phenomena. It's often forgotten that the story of Frankenstein is told aboard a ship that's bound for the North Pole. Um, and it, the, the narrator is actually a sea captain named Captain Walton. Um, in fact, this was a period while the rest of the world was, was quite cold. The North Pole, for some reason, melted. So very much like today, there was a rush to the North Pole that she was surely reading about in the newspaper accounts. Um, but Walton kind of expresses in the very first t pages of the novel uh, this kind of desire for an encounter with the Poles. Uh, I won't read this whole letter, but he talks about how as he moves north, um, he feels this cold breeze on his face. And he says, this breeze which has traveled from the regions to which I'm advancing gives me a foretaste of those icy climes. Inspired by this wind of promise, my daydreams bef become more fervent and vivid. I try in vain to be persuaded that the Pole is a seat of frost and desolation. It presents itself to my imagination ever as a region of beauty and delight. A feeling I can kind of share. And it, this actually becomes a very important kind of driver in the novel because it's out on the, on the ice, running like a crazy man, that Walton um, picks up Frankenstein and sees the monster running by as trying to escape from his uh, from, from the pursuit of Frankenstein um, across these f icy um, plains that have entrapped his boat. And finally, um, he picks up Frankenstein and nurses him back to health. He's frozen half to death. And finally, on his deathbed, Dr. Frankenstein agrees to confess what it is that has brought him to the Arctic. And he knows that the story that he's about to tell, which we, of course, all know roughly, um, the story that he has created a creature and brought it to life is hardly to be believed and um, in fact it, it's always this play of whether it's a true story or fiction that makes it a horror story um, but he says to Captain Walton prepare to hear of occurrences that are usually deemed marvelous were we among the tamer scenes of nature I might fear to encounter your unbelief perhaps your ridicule but many things will appear possible in this wild and mysterious regions which would provoke the laughter of those unacquainted with the ever varied powers of nature. So clearly this encounter with an unfamiliar or um, kind of fearsome environment is a kind of part of what shatters Mary's own imagination and opens up this possibility for imagining monsters or so we might like to believe that that's at least part of what this what inspired her. Um, and then when it's when it is uh, retold to Captain Walton in the form of a fictional narrative, we again have this claim that you could believe stories that would be unbelievable elsewhere, um, having seen the extremes of the Arctic. Um, and I encountered the story, in fact, as part of my research at Arizona State University, where I have um, many of my uh, great colleagues from there. Um, and I was, I was doing some research about the regulation of geoengineering technologies. And it was in an article about geoengineering regulation that I first encountered this whole history of how Shelley came to write um, about, you know, write this, this novel in the context of a climate crisis. And it was it, with this very um, understated claim that such a climatic disruption has inspired scientific as well as literary insight that this project was born. Because little did they know at the time this dark and ungenial summer that she complained about and that gets reflected in the text would come to be remembered as the year without a summer 
and it wasn't merely a year. Um, it was a, a cold period and it wasn't merely in Europe or around the Lake, Lake Geneva. It was actually all over the world um, that climatic disturbances were encountered and only much, much later we come to know why. Um, as you've already given away my secret to the story, but um, this was because of a volcanic eruption that happened on April 10th, 1815. It took a whole year before that enormous eruption um, and the gases and um, particles that it spewed into the atmosphere would travel all around the world. It's the largest in Mount Tambora in, on the Indonesian island of Sumbawa. Um, erupted and it's the largest eruption of the last 10,000 years or by, by many estimates. Um, and it's one of the few that was strong enough to send the gas and part particulate matter up into the upper atmosphere, which is why it had such global impact. Um, it cooled the whole planet and it darkened the atmosphere even to the point of um, creating a visible disturbance. People could see sunspots for the first time. And there was a real, you could say, atmosphere of horror. One can imagine what, but how it might have um, manifested in artistic or creative responses, even though there was none of the uh, communications infrastructure, even the di direct observations that were made um, couldn't circulate around the globe at the speed that they could today. Um, but nonetheless, we can look back into the literary and historical record and see evidence of the impact of that. Um, that event. So a year without a winter um, became a kind of ref way of re thinking about the climate crisis that we, we face today by looking back at that historical moment um, and kind of using it to reframe this period of 2015 to 2018. So it was a, I like to think of it as a collective thought experiment or um, I came to think of it with along with my collaborator on the um, first phase of the project, Cynthia Celine, uh, and who did scenario planning and uh, futuring exercises as a kind of collective thought experiment or a future scenario exercise in which we would take this period, the present, to think um, what would happen if there was a year without a winter. In the year without a summer, Frankenstein and many other interesting um, artistic projects were born what kind of monsters, what kind of artworks, what kinds of literature might arise from a year without a winter? Could we envision a novel or maybe some other kind of artwork that we'd be looking at in 200 years? And people would be saying, yeah, when they had that climate crisis, uh, a year without a winter, when you know it was just at the point that the CO2 emissions were so high that it was going to be um, you know, a year without a winter, they wrote this novel, and we should still think about the morals of that today. Of course, this would be the great dream of um, trying to commission an artwork that would stand the test of time. Um, but nonetheless, it was has been a, a very productive, and I, I think perhaps we have um, in this room, uh, perhaps we have the authors that will, will be read for the next 200 years. So let us all aspire to that. Um, but what it became, in fact, was a project that enrolled a broad a variety of people into thinking through aspects of this story, and often with reference to this other historical moment. So thinking through analogies to the writing of Frankenstein, um, to the eruption of the volcano, which turns out has inspired um, not only artistic but scientific innovations, including geoengineering experiments to mimic the effects of volcanoes, which after all seem to have been quite effective in cooling the climate. So now um, serious research is underway. Um, also research that I think maybe is, people are laughing a little bit because there's also some very scary kind of Frankenstein-like Franken-planet uh, sounding research, but also um, some very serious research into um, interventions that might be used to mitigate or slow down or, or reverse some of the worst effects of climate change. And some of those actually do uh, mimic volcanic eruptions um, through the injection of some of the same gases into the upper atmosphere that, that happens through a volcanic eruption. Um, so some of those analogies that drove the project were to look back at, um, at 1816 and the period thereafter, at the so-called year without a summer. Um, it was a period during which the northern hemisphere was um, plunged into frost and cold. The southern hemisphere um, experienced disturbances in the monsoon, so heavy rains in some places and droughts in others. 
Um, it's widely thought that the cholera epidemic of the 1830s and 40s that swept around the globe was exacerbated by um, the t volcanic eruption. And of course, with that followed incredible humanitarian consequences, um, malnutrition, spread, spread of disease, um, social disruption, political destabilization, perhaps also revolution, um, religious um, resurgences and migration in the US, for example, and of course, a great deal of artistic inspiration. Frank not only Frankenstein, um, but also the landscape painting of the period is widely uh, regarded as um, reflecting um, sort of strangely colored skies. So um, Turner and Caspar David Friedrich, for example, who paint these incredible skies, were probably actually looking at uh, skies reddened or darkened um, in part by volcanic gases and, and ash. So it's quite extraordinary to look back at their work and scientists have even looked back at art history in order to reconstruct the historical record of, of what happened um, in the climate. And so use, using paintings as proxy data in the way that they would also use ice cores and, and other such um, data. So what, are, what happens now? Um, well, as I mentioned, we envisioned this initially as a future scenario exercise, but what happened was that um, in the course of the last three years, we have experienced consecutive breaking of the record for the hottest year on record. So it turned out that what we envisioned as a future exercise arrived far too soon, and it seems that this is a period that is plausibly called a year without a winter, especially in some places. Um, all the climate models are predict a steady rise in temperature, weather is more extreme and unpredictable. Uh, we are certainly making decisions under, consistent, uh, under conditions of extreme uncertainty. And I just want to say, sort of stop for a second and say, this is a very interesting contrast to uh, the Tambora moment. Because on, in the Tambora moment, you know, we look back and we say, well, they didn't know what was going on. Yeah, Benjamin Franklin thought it was a volcano, but I mean, for the most part, um, compared to the kind of information that we have now about the past and about our present environment, it seems as though they were in the dark and we're in the know. But in fact, although we have so much more information, so much more understanding, so much more communications, real-time communications, we can watch the volcano on TV as it erupts, like it is in today in Hawaii, for example, um, but nonetheless, the conditions of uncertainty don't seem to be uh, radically improved. Um, and there are many reasons for that that I think we'll discuss over the weekend. But there's a sense in which our experience of the climate crisis is quite comparable. Um, the melting glaciers, rising sea levels, etc. I think we'll move through these uh, richly through the week. Um, so in, we, we find ourselves today in this condition um, called the Anthropocene, which is we could think of as a kind of some uh, some total of this condition of destabilization and uncertainty, although many other factors contribute to the Anthropocene. I'll leave that out for the moment. Um, but this, of course, became an intriguing question to think about, okay, well, if we're kind of in the midst of this in uncertain conditions or in a way immersed in a dark cloud, much as um, people were during the Tambora moment, well, can we be a bit more specific about this? And here's where it becomes interesting to try to narrow down and specify what this question could mean, what this scenario could mean. Um, so we collaborated with um, Melissa Bukowski, a meteorologist from the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And her initial, as soon as I raised this question with her and um, our, our colleague Linda Mearns, they immediately got into this fascinating discussion about like, okay, well, a year without a winter, what, what would that mean meteorologically? To, to be honest, as a philosopher, um, you know, and by the way, in the art science collaboration, the philosopher always wins. <laughs> it's always, always the most interesting for me. Um, so in this case, was not, was just the same. They they started to try to address this question. Well, what would this actually mean meteorologically? How would you define it? Because once you could define it, you could start to look at the models and say, okay. When would it happen in this place? When would it happen in this place? You know, does one model say you're going to get a year without a winter this year? Another one says you've got 50 years. Well, that really matters if you're going to think about building infrastructure or maybe even migrating from the place. Um, so she developed a definition, kind of uh, provisional, but nonetheless provocative, 
is that the year without a meteorological winter would be the year when the coldest winters become warmer than the warmest winters of the past. So in other words, this would be the winter when you, you definitely could just get rid of those new boots forever and never get them back out, for example. And based on that definition, um, she plugged that into a number of different models and she came up with projections that averaged around placing a year without a winter somewhere between the mid to the, the, the second, uh, the, to the final quarter of this century. So some 2050 for some places in the world, more like 2080 for others. Um, quite foreseeable within our lifetimes or the lifetimes of our children. Um, and that's a, that's a meant to be a sort of extreme definition of what a year without a winter could be. It's a, it would be a change that you could feel and it would be a change that wouldn't happen just as one, it, you would have to have a big change in order to have a, a one year that was that extreme of a difference. We of course have occasionally a warm winter, cool summer, um, but such an extreme difference would be a, a radical difference in the climatic norms. Um, and nonetheless, I think there are places where already these kinds of changes are becoming relatively uh, common. Um, this is an example of Aqua Alta in Venice. Venice has always flooded, it's built on canals, but it's becoming more and more common um, to see people going around Venice, often at the art fairs, um, in these charming items of clothing, uh, boots that go up over your knees. So this actually became an interesting site of one of our, our first investigations into um, this question of how we might register through a creative response our direct encounters, our engagements um, with a changing climate. Um, it's, it's often said that we don't have a direct experience of climate, that what we experience is weather, that climate is a long-term trend. Um, so you could ask the question, well, what kind of an art form uh, could capture an experience of a change in climate? Would we have to have a novel that tells a story over a long period of time, maybe with an omnipotent narrator that can see from a lot of different perspectives? Or would a painting that captures a snapshot in time be capable of doing that? Or is the art form of today perhaps a digital form, something that never would have arisen um, during the 1816, for example? Um, and this led to uh, one of the first publications of this uh, this project, an article um, with my colleague Cynthia Celine, uh, called Unseasonal Fashion, in which we explored the notion that maybe, from, um, in, in, in all times, fashion, actually clothing, is our site of encounter, where we may not think that we have an experience of climate change or know what's going on in the models, but actually we alter our uh, preparedness and our express our desires about the environment that we live in on a daily basis um, through the clothing that we choose. Actually, a, um, a meteorologist said to me once, if I was to look in your closet, I would learn something about the climate that you live in. But if I was to look at what you're wearing today, I would look at the weather. I could learn something about the weather. Um, and I, I found this old cartoon uh, from uh, light summer clothing from the year 1801, which was actually part of this period known as the Little Ice Age, which may have also been caused by volcanic eruptions. Um, it was clearly, <laughs> clearly a kind of unhappy uh, response to the English weather. Um, and clearly being prepared for the weather in a, in a region is a site at which um, you can always learn something about w what people are well, what they wish for, or what they really would like to avoid in this case, um, and what they have to kind of, as a practical matter, encounter on a daily basis. For example, um, in this case, a very fine, fabulous suit worn by a, a New York socialite in the 1960s is inspired by a fur suit worn on um, a successful expedition to the North Pole. Um, so we have these examples of um, polar fashions, of fashions uh, for flooding. We see this on the runways today, um, in, in this case a 2010 show which shows a sort of mashup of uh, preparedness for various climates. Um, in some cases it's in the more conceptual art vein like this 
dress by Jacqueline Brady, which inflates when if you enter water. It'd be a useful article of clothing for the climate change prepared. Um, this became an, uh, the basis for an exhibition that we held in Copenhagen of the work of Anne van Galen, who dressed her uh, models for a future in which there would be endless rainfall. Um, so not to protect against the rain, but rather simply to live in the rain and kind of mildly expose the body um, and protect it only in, to the most minimal degree. Um, so these were, this was the nature of our questions as we start to try, started to refine um, a way of really posing the question of what kind of artwork would arise during a year without a winter, which ultimately led to the central, um, one of the central features of this project, which was an opportunity to reenact the dare. And I'm really honored to be joined today by uh, Tobias Bakel and Hilary Hartnett and Vandana Singh, who are all present for the dare. Um, in this in this case, we we returned um, to a house of horrors of sorts, <laughs> uh, spiders and other such critters that are accompanied us. Um, four science fiction writers and a group of scholars, scientists, a uh, scenario planner, myself a philosopher, um, my colleagues from the Center for Science and the Imagination at Arizona State University. We went with a group of people and we decided that we would try to reconstruct some of the conditions uh, that allegedly inspired Mary Shelley and her literary comrades um, to begin writing this famous novel. Um, so we went to, not to Lake Geneva, which could have been an interesting place to reenact the dare, um, but rather to a kind of parallel and you could say opposite location, a place where a year without a winter will certainly be felt with great um, intensity, namely the Arizona desert. Um, but, uh, we were lucky to uh, find that there was to be a particularly interesting house to visit in the Arizona desert, um, namely the, the architectural uh, experimental town of Arcosanti, which is pictured here. And interestingly, this is a sort of uh, provocative, has already figured in science fiction narratives. And as you can see, it kind of looks like a place that you might find in a science fiction film um, or a story. And I think it's kind of in, in itself stages this uh, conversation that happens between different art forms, between architecture, film, um, fiction, and um, of course, dressing appropriately in this environment also poses an interesting question. So we spent um, we spent a day and night uh, at Arcosanti and another day in Arizona, during which we ran through, um, we, went, we told this story and we read some of the literature and poetry that was written during 1816 as well as some contemporary literature. And we talked also about the science. Um, Hillary gave a lecture about what, what was happening to the oceans. Uh, we heard about efforts in experiments in geoengineering, experiments with new energy models, and we tried to sort of think our way into a year without a winter as a situation that might come at some point in the future or might come in the present. And what has come out of this is a collection of four science fiction stories um, that are the core of this book, which will come out next month, which is a collection of academic essays, and science fiction stories, as well as visual arts. Um, so I, I would love to say more about this, uh, the, the stories, but instead we have the authors here and we're gonna speak on a panel tomorrow. So I'll say, um, please come to the panel between three and four tomorrow. And I think we'll hear more about this and probably some of their, um, their other writing. Um, I won't give it away, but they're um, totally amazing stories, and they are also coming out online, so they can, they're, they're all, I believe, free uh, to read online over the course of this year, and we hope people will be reading them in 200 years as well. Um, so I'll, I'll skip through a little bit of these images of, of where we held the dare, um, but it's an inspiring environment in some way, um, and full of all sorts of inconveniences that we as the organizers didn't anticipate, like the fact that as soon as we sat down in the desert to read a poem, a rain cloud just came like out of a video game and just 
and rain directly on us, <laughs> only as long as it took to get us to move the chair. And then as soon as we moved the chairs underneath it, it just and left. Is I don't know. I, is this uncanny? I, I can't. You can't even. You can't prove that this would happen. But it it seemed like this happened. Um, but after the the success and also the learning experiences of the dare, um, what happened? I realized is that. I ended up finding myself restaging the dare in a lot of different geographical contexts and also in different media. So working with artists with all sorts of different media practices and sometimes in different geographical regions to kind of think this through. Um, that included working with an artist named Carolina Sobeka, who I think of as a kind of modern Frankenstein of this project herself. Um, she's been conducting experiments on the DNA that inhabit, uh, that inhabit clouds and cause ice nucleation. So she's doing biological experiments on the atmosphere. If that's not a Frankenstein project, I, I don't know what it is. Um, she is an artist um, working with and kind of as a scientist and in fact sometimes is so um, give such a literal performance of her science that I, I actually get confused when, I, when I'm working with her. You know, it's, is this real or is it not real? Um, and this is, it's, it's definitely at the edge. Um, and part of that, part of the purpose of that working in that way is precisely to generate conversations like this one that happened at an exhibition in Arizona um, about the risks and promises of experimenting um, with and upon the environment and the kind of imperatives that we might have for trying to think about ways of manipulating the climate. As it is, of course, um, an extremely dire situation and it's easy to be against Frankenstein, but it's very hard to be uh, once we have a situation on our hands to, to realize what to do with it. Um, so I'm going to skip through this a, a bit. I'd be happy to tell you more about the project. It was also exhibited in Copenhagen. Um, but I'd like to come finally to the point at which I lost all track of my role as a philosopher or a collaborator and found myself having inhabited this narrative um, so thoroughly that um, I didn't know which character I was in the historical story or in the fictional story. Uh, a year ago, I found myself um, with an amazing opportunity to travel to Antarctica. And I immediately imagined that I was traveling the path of Captain Walton, only in reverse, and heading to the South Pole. And very much like Walton, I, I thought of this line that I try in vain to be persuaded that the pole is a seat of frost and desolation, but it presents itself to my imagination as a region of beauty and delight. Um, and I was especially fortunate because this opportunity came and it, at, at, at very short notice, and it was actually to travel with a group of artists um, as part of the Antarctic Biennale, the first art exhibition in Antarctica. Something so fabulous and so absurd that I, of course, um, it fits so well into the story that it, it started to become almost unreal as to whether it was living in the story or telling it. or. Um, and this is when I, I think I, I became swallowed by the narrative and felt I was actually being chased or and or chasing a monster that I had created. Um, and again, very much like like Captain Walton or uh, Ernst Shackleton, we departed from Ushuaia and at the um, southern tip of Argentina. And this was the first art uh, work that I encountered after a long trip through the Drake Passage, one of the stormiest places in the world. Um, this is a, I would say, a fascinating take on art, what art in Antarctica could, could be. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to show you a few more pictures, but I would say um, coming, I would love to come back to this image um, and think about whether this is the kind of ultimate uh, indictment of, uh, of human beings for our, our activities and our impacts on Antarctica, or this is a kind of redemption of what an artistic um, en engagement or exposure to this environment of our, with uh, subject to our impact could be. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. I also encountered works like this, a tree, um, a cocoa tree alone in the, in the snow. Um, in fact, kind of a gesture towards an ancient environment that's visible in the fossil record in Antarctica. Um, of course, it could also be that 
in the not distant enough future, Antarctica would also become a hospitable environment for this tree. So it's a kind of object that involves um, a gesture towards a, it gestures towards a possible future and a past as, at the same time. Um, I, I was there actually to review the the exhibition for Freeze, which I, um, in retrospect, is extremely funny. It's an art magazine called Freeze, and much like the roast, this is the perfect place um, to talk about climate change. I also decided at this point that I could die happy and I'll never have such a great job again, although this is a quite enjoyable one as well. <laughs> um, but it was actually on this trip that I also encountered an artist who would become um, a, a kind of late joining participant in the project. It was really fascinating. Um, so it's not surprising if anyone's seen this Ver uh, Werner Herzog film about Antarctica, there's this really funny moment in which he says, um, all these crazy people find themselves, it's like as if they fell to the bottom of the planet and they find themselves in Antarctica. Well, I found, um, I had that kind of experience <laughs> with some of the artists and curators and scientists that I met on that trip. And one of them um, was crazy enough to kind of share in my thought process when I realized very late in the, in the conduct of this project about a year ago or a little bit less than a year ago last summer, that there was one site missing on my exploration of where and when and how um, this story hangs together, where I should be thinking about climate change and what environmental crisis today is. Where is that? Tambora, the volcano. Um, I realized that at some point that the volcano was just a character in my story. It was the cause of a climate crisis that had occupied my attention for the last several years, but I actually didn't know a whole lot about what it looked like, uh, what who lived around it today, what stories were told about it, you know, what, what it meant in its own context. Um, so I decided, I also found myself, um, I was already planning a summer holiday uh, to Thailand actually to visit some family and friends and I realized I can travel to Tambora in Indonesia. And I suggested to an artist friend, um, we should go, we should go. And he had actually just gotten a commission to do an exhibition um, in Switzerland at the site of a catastrophic flood that happened in 1818. It was the 200th anniversary of this catastrophic flood that happened as a consequence of the volcano. So we both had these imperatives that came out of an art context to um, address this site in some way. So um, with very little plan, but a uh, kind of certainty that this was an important site, we traveled to Tambora. On, this, is, this is my picture of the, of the plane window. This is the um, Google satellite view, obviously. So in all honesty, we really weren't sure what we would see or whether we'd really be able to see anything. Um, we wished that we had thought of it earlier and planned to travel with volcanologists and all sorts of astute uh, scholars. Um, instead, we traveled um, largely guided by Jill and Darcy Wood's um, book, Tambora, the, uh, the eruption that shook the world, and, and some of his travel notes from when he had climbed it a few years earlier. Um, but in some way, we were quite, we were quite blind um, to the situation that we were encountered, encountering, which made it both quite scary and in the end quite inspiring. Uh, we expected in our plans to visit the volcanic monitoring station, uh, quite a mysterious, you know, large-scale operation. Um, instead, we found a, a small office, which it seem, seems is quite adequate to um, run a seismograph and monitor, monitor the activity of this volcano, which almost sunk the entire world into a deep freeze. It did actually detect some um, quite significant rumbling a few years ago, enough to evacuate the island. So it seemed to be in quite good working order. Um, but we weren't able to learn much more about the volcano um, at this research station, partially because of the language barrier and partially because it was a quite routine monitoring station. And these are based all over Indonesia, which has a string of volcanoes. And uh, from all that we can discern from our, our guides and our encounters there, Tambora was not a cause of great concern, although there was some um, interest in it as a developing um, tourist destination, and people were quick to tell us the story of Mary Shelley and a year without a summer. So um, as we set off on our trip up the, the mountain, 
Um, it looked for quite a long time like this, and the plan was to drive part of the way and then hike the, way, the rest of the way up. Um, but we quickly had to abandon the car, um, and we continued traveling through a fog, um, which initially was quite frustrating because we were not entirely prepared. Um, we were not, we were unseasonably dressed for this encounter, not um, knowing too well what the weather would be like. We were cold and wet and we began to squabble about um, why we had decided to take this trip and uh, why, you know, why had I dragged him along? And I said, well, why would you be full enough to come? And um, <laughs> it was just this kind of inspiring uh, discomfort that carried us up the mountain. But as we climbed, actually, for hours through this fog, eventually we sort of lost track of our, our goal of reaching the top, because anyway, we couldn't see it. Um, and we started to play in the fog, and we sort of ran in and out of it and sort of experimented like this with how far we could go away from each other but before you could not see the other person anymore. And um, we became sort of fascinated by the foliage that we encountered along the way. And then all of a sudden, we reached the top of the mountain, and it looked like this. And as we looked out over the crater, what we realized was that the mountain was absolutely submerged in a fog, and then hot air from the volcanic crater swept up the edge of the crater and created this thick, thick, incredible wall of fog. Um, and it was along that it was along that trip that we learned from our guides that Tambora had a translation. Um, into the, from it, from the uh, the Bima language that's spoken on the island of Sambawa, and it translates as an invitation to disappear. And there's a lot of speculation about um, what that might mean, or if it's quite a right translation. One w one way of interpreting it is that perhaps it's a sort of um, it's even a sort of epithet, like get lost, you know, like go away. Um, but it. It resonated with us on this climb in so many ways as we kind of appeared and disappeared into this mountain. And we looked at this crater and imagined this mountain that used to be there. It was quite steep towards the edge. It was one of these volcanoes that goes up like this. And we imagined sort of looking out over it, you know, is that what it takes to be up in the sky in order to shroud the whole world in a cold mist? Um, so. After that encounter, uh, we made our way back down and um, thought with a little bit of stress about what we were actually going to do with this story because it was it was moving and, and in many ways. Um, and as we as we descended and kind of returned, we encountered a whole bunch of sites like this, um, as well as like this. Um, and this is the the landscape. This is the reality of the landscape um, in much of the surrounding region. Um, in Indonesia and in, in many parts of Southeast Asia, uh, scenes of very serious deforestation, of um, cutting down of the old peat forests and the, um, the native um, rainforests and jungles to make way for palm oil plantations. So the harvest of this uh, delicious delicacy fruit that we all have all over us and in us right now. Um, and so we realized with a kind of of horror that um, the slopes of Tambora and the surrounding regions were bare, largely, um, not only because they had been um, cleared of vegetation by the volcano, and you can still see huge volcanic rocks and imagine them just flying out of the sky and dropping there not such a long time ago, but also because many, many of the surrounding landscapes had been, um, had been burned or cut to the ground. And this became ultimately the inspiration for um, a new artwork, a film and installation work by um, Julien Charrière, the artist who climbed with me, called An Invitation to Disappear. Um, and this, um, in part, is a film, and it's an, an exhibition that opened uh, a couple weeks ago at uh, Kunsthalle Mainz in Germany. And it centers around um, a film. And these are stills from the film. I'd love to show you a little bit if we have time. Uh, but it very much looks like this. It's a kind of ambiguous scene at first. It could be a fire in the jungle, or um, maybe the stirrings of volcanic, a volcanic eruption. Um, but if you listen to the sound, you'll hear that there's a heavy beat 
that you can um, hear as you as you move towards this space and move into the room where the film is showing. And actually what it is, is it's a party. It's a techno party, a, a rave, and it's deep inside a palm plantation. And um, if this strikes you as a most incredibly crass and horrific thing to do, to party deep inside the jungle, uh, inside the, a place where a jungle once was, in a place where a palm oil um, plantation now is, um, it, it really should actually disturb our peace. And um, although you've given away that this was actually filmed in Thailand, it's actually, in principle, the work is filmed at a, an undisclo undisclosed location. And the idea of the work is to really pose this question of how it is that we relate towards this. Uh, what is, if there was a kind of dark cloud that came from Indonesia 200 years ago and shrouded the world in um, cold and darkness, there is again a dark cloud that comes from Southeast Asia, from parts of Latin America where palm oil is harvested, many parts of the world that also uh, contributes enormously to climate change, it contributes enormously to um, species, species loss and deforestation. And um, if it seems crass to party in the jungle, I think it's rather a provocation to get us to thinking about where the party really is. Um, actually, the party is where the palm oil goes, and it goes into the cakes that we eat at kids' birthday parties, it goes into the soap that we will, and the condition, things that we use to condition our hair. It's actually the global consumption, our kind of relation, we, we consume without thinking about what it means to relate directly to a place. Um, so the installation, I'll just show you a few pictures, as a kind of staging of um, the kind of extremes of what it means to extract this resource um, from an environment, to transform an environment, and then be have a relationship to that project. Um, so this is part of an installation of um, bricks of palm oil and then a machine that, that runs on, on palm oil. And what it does is it actually just pumps fog out of a smoke machine. So it's a kind of circular process. It's in a way completely useless, much like the engine of consumption that actually drives this process of deforestation. This is how it looks in the, the exhibition. Um, the fog gives you a kind of brief uh, sort of respite from the horror that actually this generator makes, this horrific sound and the kind of horror of the content, but it looks sort of charming when it's in the scene in a silent situation. Um, and what it, what it masks, I would say, in a, in a way is this, and it was this, this was the connection that sort of came speculatively out of this encounter and out of like thinking through um, a direct encounter with this environment. Um, and finally, I think, although this is a rather pleasant image, I think, looks like a yoga studio, I would say this is actually the darkest, uh, the darkest image, the darkest artwork um, that came out of A Year Without a Winter. This is part of the installation of an invitation to disappear. Um, this lovely collection of tropical plants that you can purchase at Ikea, each one in a nice white plastic pot. Um, they can be installed in a nice calm white box where you won't be disturbed by any of the uh, scraggly underbrush that grows up not only in the jungle itself, but even in the monoculture of a palm oil plantation, which was quite a hindrance um, as we went to run the film. Um, so in conclusion, um, I would say there's a sense in which this project um, led me ultimately to think about a new site in a new way, and this is in a way my aspiration um, with, the, with this project and with the collaborations that I've been so lucky to have with artists, scientists, and scholars of a, vari a wide variety of places, is that all together through the ways that we um, encounter the world and kind of try to situate ourselves within it, I think we, op we can kind of shatter our illusions and shatter our, our habits and open up um, new ways of situating ourselves not too comfortably uh, within this world that's very much subject to our impact. Thank you.